Do you ever wonder why your phone or tablet seems to charge faster from some USB power sources, but slower or not at all on others? This is because USB ports are not all created equal. In fact, this is very far from the case. The world of USB is complex with several generations of USB, USB 1, 2, and 3, the USB battery charging and power delivery specifications, and many different types of connectors such as Type-B, Micro-B, and now a new connector called USB-C. In the beginning, USB ports were mainly used for data transfer and were only meant to deliver enough power for small peripherals. Now, we expect the humble USB port to power all sorts of devices, from fans to LED lights and to charge batteries in phones and laptops. Starting with USB 1, released in 1996, we could get up to 100 milliamps at 5 volts over 4 wires. Then, in April 2000, USB 2.0 was released with devices being classified as either low power or high power. The specs for USB 1 and 2 would be enough for powering small peripherals like mice and keyboards, but neglected to set any standards for battery charging. Without any standard for battery charging, manufacturers would go about designing their own, making for unpredictable performance, especially when, for example, mismatching a device to a charger designed for a different device. Thus, in 2007, a supplementary specification called the Battery Charging Specification was introduced. This would standardize USB power management and would define the following three types of ports. A standard downstream port. This is the same port defined by the USB 1 and 2 spec. The charging downstream port, which is a higher current USB port for PCs, laptops and other hardware. The dedicated charging port. These are power sources like wall warts that don't enumerate. They are used solely for charging with no data transfer. Shortly after in 2008, the USB 3.0 specification was released, and in addition to vast improvements in data transfer, the max current for an SDP would increase to 900 milliamps. The battery charging specification would also be updated in 2010 to allow for 1.5 amperes maximum current for charging downstream ports and dedicated charging ports. In 2012, the USB power delivery specification was introduced to deliver more power to devices with larger power demand. Prior to this, all USB ports supported only 5 volts. Now, the voltage and current are variable, and devices can negotiate with the host to draw the amount of power that they need. This ensures that a device doesn't draw too much current, which could cause it to fail, catch fire, melt, or even explode. Then, in 2014, roughly around the same time as the USB 3.1 specification, the USB Type-C connector was introduced. A USB Type-C connector has a rotationally symmetrical connector that is considerably smaller than the old standard USB connector, and only slightly larger than the Micro-B connector. You'll find cables have Type-C connectors on both ends, or sometimes just one end. The lower resistance of Type-C cables allows for the potential to deliver even more power, up to a massive 100 watts at varying voltages. Together, USB Type-C and the power delivery specification make for a powerful and dynamic combination. But with this added complexity comes more problems. Typical faults include vendors overstating the current limit of the host or USB charger, no overcurrent protection in some devices, increasing the chances of catastrophic failure, large voltage drops at high current levels when using inferior cables, especially long ones, voltage instability near the maximum current limit, voltage instability resulting from sudden changes in current, protocol errors in the power negotiation phase, advertising incorrect profiles, data corruption on the data lines during high current load on the power lines, out of spec voltages, too much ripple, and overheating when at maximum wattage. To fill the need for a testing solution, we have created a USB power delivery testing device which does the following. Tests the power delivery capability of USB ports up to 100 watts according to USB battery charging 1.2 and USB power delivery standards. Detects proprietary charges and adjusts the maximum current accordingly. Negotiates voltage levels with host PD controller chip to switch between different voltage levels from 5 volts to 20 volts. Dissipates 50 watts of continuous load and up to 100 watts for short periods. A large heatsink and dual fans at the rear that turn on and off depending on the internal temperature of the heatsink. When used in conjunction with the USB loopback tester, tests communication speed, data integrity, and power delivery of USB ports simultaneously. It is controllable and configurable over USB interface via an API to adjust the load. It has built-in protection against overcurrent, overvoltage, overtemperature, and ESD. There is an isolated USB monitoring port which protects the monitoring machine, and a bootloader which allows updating the firmware in-field. 
Passmark's USB power delivery testers come foam packed in a box, which include three cables, a USB 2.0 Type B to Type A cable, a USB 3.1 Type C to Type C cable, and a USB 3.1 Type A to Type C cable, a card on how to get started, and of course, the test device itself. The device features a built-in LCD screen to display the voltage, the current, the port type, a dial button to adjust the current and to switch test modes, a Type-C input port to connect to the port that is being tested, a USB 3.0 Type-A output port to, as an option, connect to loopback device, a USB drive or any USB device, a Type-B monitoring port to connect to the computer running the monitoring software, or just any USB power source if we don't need to run the monitoring software. Here we have a Samsung phone charger, and the advertised amperage is 2 amperes. Let's go ahead and connect it to our power delivery tester using the Type-C to Type-A cable. Here, the LCD tells us that we have a dedicated charging port. By default, our test device will set a maximum current limit for dedicated charging ports at 1.5 amperes. But because the charger advertises 2 amperes, we want to go higher than 1.5. Let's open up the test software and go to configure and then check disable current limit. Now let's increase the current to see what happens. We can see that the voltage is stable as we increase the current all the way up to 2 amperes, so it's working as advertised. We can even go a little bit above 2 amperes, but if we go too far, we see it drop out suddenly. This means the device has a working built-in current limiter. Without a limiter, connecting it to a device that draws more current than it's supposed to handle could cause it to overheat or even melt. Let's try another wall wart, this time with a different amperage. Here we have an Apple wall wart with an advertised amperage of 1 ampere. This time let's do a sweep of the voltage versus the current to get a nice graph. Click the button labelled Voltage versus Current Graph and the test software will sweep the current from zero to the limit and graph the resulting voltage. Graphs are colour coded to show regions in which we have gone out of specification, which are shaded red, and regions in which we are within specification, which are shaded green. The regions shaded grey represent permissible values if the port is shutting down or is being detached. We can see that the voltage starts off a little bit above 5 volts and then gradually falls to about 5 volts as we approach the advertised maximum current. It continues on the same trend even further past this limit before it drops out suddenly at about 1.2 amperes. As you can see here, this USB charger has stayed within specification from zero up to the max manufacturer's advertised current, 1 ampere. Thus, it's fair to say that this wall wart is working as advertised. Now let's try a USB 3.0 port on this machine here. On the LCD screen, we can see that it's detected a standard downstream port. We also see a message appear at the bottom, saying max 500 milliamps unless USB 3 enumerated. This is because the test device will by default enumerate a standard downstream port as USB 2 port and will thus set the maximum current at 500 milliamps. We need to manually change this to USB 3 with a maximum current of 900 milliamps. We do this by pressing the dial button and clicking on SDP current limit 500 milliamps. Let's increase the current all the way up to the limit. In the LCD screen, we can see the voltage gradually drop below 5 volts. If we disable the maximum current and turn the dial up, we can see that the port allows us to keep drawing more and more current. It seems like there's no built-in current limiter to protect the port from drawing too much current from it like we saw with the wall warts. Now let's try a USB Type-C port on this computer here. When we connect it, the screen shows us that a Type-C port has been detected. The maximum current is also now displayed as 3000 milliamps. Notice the icon displayed next to the voltage showing two arrows. This tells us that the voltage is negotiable, meaning we can switch between different voltage and current profiles. If we click the dial button, we will see a list of different profiles that we can choose from. Let's select the first profile and do a voltage versus current sweep to produce a graph. We can see that the voltage starts strong at 5 volts and slowly but steadily drops to around 4.3 volts. For each of these profiles, the acceptable within specification voltage range is plus or minus 5%. Here the port has gone out of specification at around 1.2 amperes and onwards, where the voltage has fallen below 4.75 volts. Note that the log window will display messages in red when the voltage has gone under or over specification range. Now let's select the second profile. We see a similar pattern here, but the drop is now from 12 volts to about 11 volts. Here, the port has gone out of specification at around 2.5 amperes and onwards, 
Let's now pick the third profile and see what pattern we get. Here we get a very interesting pattern. The port actually starts out out of specification until about 1.3 amperes where it stays within the acceptable range from then on. The USB power delivery tester can be used in conjunction with loopback devices. So let's attach a loopback device to the loopback port and see what happens when we test data transfer speeds and power delivery at the same time. First, Let's connect the USB 3.0 port to the input port. To enable the testing with the loopback device, press the dial button and click on the loopback port setting so that it is set to enable. Depending on which way the Type-C end of the cable has been plugged in, we may need to flip this around to use the data wires. If this is the case, a warning message will appear telling you to rotate the connection. We'll then connect a loopback device in this case, a Passmark USB 3.0 loopback device to the middle output port. Now let's open the USB 3.0 test software and begin a loopback test. The loopback test will send data back and forth between the machine and the loopback device. Now let's increase the current to see that things are working as expected for both the power delivery and data transfer speeds. The loopback port can also be used with a USB drive or a USB device such as a phone. Let's connect it to this phone here and see how much current the loopback port draws as we turn up the dial. Interestingly, we see here that as we turn up the current being drawn from our power source, the current being drawn by this phone here actually decreases. To find out more or make an order, simply go to our website www.passmark.com or email us at info at Thanks for watching!